Zechariah. Right. And Zechariah, let's have a look at this. Zechariah is a wonderful, wonderful book. And uh, as we read through Zechariah, we'll see lots of similarities to the prophets that we've been looking at before. Um, because a lot of these prophets were written at the same time. Zechariah was written very much at the same time as Haggai. So one of the characters that comes in Zechariah is my favourite. Begins with Z and ends with Bull. And it's Zerubbabel. <laughs> but we don't talk much about him today. But I just love that name, so I had to get it out at some point. But what it is, it's, it's a message really that God is visibly establishing his kingdom here on earth. And God's word through Zechariah's prophecy comes into a really confused place. Judah was a very confused place. It was sinful, it was idolatrous, it was a world which had been led by blind and bad shepherds. You know, and God even says, you know, I'm going to take these shepherds away. I'm going to be the shepherd. We'll be looking at that later. But what he's really saying is, I know it's idolatrous. I know it's horrible. I know everything's going wrong, just as it is here, just as it is today, just as it's been for years and years and years. But what God is saying is, I am sorting it out. Watch me. And that's the key of the whole thing is, watch me. I'm doing it. So Zechariah is a message for today just as much as it was a message for 2,500 years ago. And um, it's, um, it, it's a book, it's printed all in one book. Let's see if I can get this working. Ah, look at that. Uh, but it's sort of in three sections. And um, the first cha cha section, if you like, and they're often called Zechariah 1, 2 and 3, strangely enough, although it's all in one book. But Zechariah 1 really covers chapters 1 to 8. Then Zechariah 2 ca covers chapters 9 to 11. And then Zechariah 3 captures, or, um, covers 12 to 14. And really what they're about is, chapter 1 is God describes the actions that he will take and he does this through pictures, so we're going to have a look at pictures in a minute. And then in the part, second part, God is seen as a divine warrior. And then in the last one, he's the wonderful picture of the kingdom of God coming. So that's really sort of a little bit of an outline of what it's all about. Now, pictures. We all like pictures, don't we? And he uses pictures a lot. So what's that a picture of? Moses. Moses, yeah, we know that instantly, don't we? I'm just testing you. What's this one? Yeah. They're eating apples. <sighs> yeah. Uh, Jonah. Jonah eating a big, being eaten by a big fish. Yeah. Noah. Noah. Yeah. They're not quite going in two by two because there's quite a lot of giraffes there, but never mind. Um, I just like the picture. Okay, so it's a bit of a puzzle sometimes with the pictures. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go through every little bit of the whole thing because that just would take us for all year. But I want to go through some of the pictures of Zechariah because there are some quite striking pictures and I'm just going to summarise them in one line or two lines. Okay? So... This is the one that we're looking at now. We're looking at Zechariah part one, and that's chapters one to eight, which is really mostly the pictures, and then we'll look at seven and eight later. Okay. So that was the first picture, and the first picture is a vision of horsemen. And really what it's actually saying, summarised, is God is keeping watch over Jerusalem and Judah. And, it, you know, what it's doing is fulfilling Hosea 2.23. You remember Hosea, that wonderful, wonderful prophet, which starts off with that tragedy of statement, which basically God is saying, I will call my people, not my people. Well, this is the reverse. This is where God is saying, you are my people. This is God bringing his people back. So the next one is the vision of the horns and craftsmen. And people have puzzled long over this, even longer than some of the Revelation ones. And really what it is, in, in many ways, to me anyway, it's that God is aware of the attacks and oppression on Judah and is sending someone who will take away the horn, will take away, because horns are synonymous with power and that sort of thing. So these are people, these craftsmen are coming and I love the way they've got the anvils, they're going to get those horns and smash them up. That's basically what God's going to do with other, what people think they've got power. God can smash it up. And then there's a man with a measuring line. And um, 
Well, that's uh, really one. And what it's doing is it's actually measuring, you know, a, ci a city of salvation. It's, it's, it's the city of Messiah will be, you know, won't be measured by a tape measure anymore. This is the exciting thing. There, there are not going to be enough walls. You can't build a wall big enough to contain what's coming into the kingdom of God. So isn't that exciting? You know, you can measure it now, but you won't be able to measure it because God's kingdom is so much bigger. Oh, shush. <laughs> Got to learn how to stop that one day. And then you've got a vision of Joshua, the high priest. I don't know if I've got a picture for that one. No, I haven't. So I'll skip. Um, we've got a picture of, of Joshua, the high priest. And that's really sort of saying, I'm establishing the priestly line in Jerusalem through Joshua. That's the Haggai Joshua. And so this is where it links in with Haggai and saying, you know, I'm establishing the high priest, but my high priest is a different high priest. And then we've got the golden lampstand. And the golden lampstand is really the holy temple of God. And this is his very presence in the midst. And he's establishing that through Zerubbabel. Lovely word, isn't it? And that again is through Haggai. And this is the true presence of God being established in Judah. And he's going to be established through Jesus. So all these visions, all these pictures are actually ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Every single one. So then we've got the vision of the flying scroll. And that speaks of judgment and judgment, you know, of the law, the Torah. And that's why it's so important when Jesus says, I have come to fulfill the law, fully fill the law. So we're, when we accept Jesus into our lives, when we move into his presence, we are being covered of the law through Jesus. I just think, find that's absolutely mind boggling. And then there's a the woman in the basket. <laughs> And this is really talking about the removal of wicked. The basket and the woman in the basket speaks of evil. That's not being sexist or anything like that. It's just the way it is. And, but it talks about removal of wickedness from Judah. And who removes the wickedness? Who is the one who cleanses us from all sin? Jesus. So, and then this last one is the vision of the four chariots. And the four chariots are wonderful because this is God sending in the heavy artillery. Because that's what chariots were. They were heavy artillery. And I remember when I was a little kid in Spain, and we used to have, there's a place called Sevilla Films near us, where they made things like Ben-Hur, and they made other films. And uh, I used to go up there and see all these extras who were all my mates. And um, one day, there's a chap called Juan, who was one of the lighting engineers. But every so often, he'd pop up, and he'd be Peter. Or another time, he'd come up, and he'd be a Roman centurion. Or another time, he'd pop up, because they all played different parts. And he invited me to go see a film. And I can't remember what the film was. I think it was the um, Fall of the Roman Empire. But they were filming a charge of chariots. And they had full weight chariots with full horses and everything. The noise was deafening. It was phenomenal. And this is what God is saying. He said, when I come, the noise will be deafening. It will be terrifying for those who are afraid. And I find that really comforting. Don't you? So, you know, this is what, what these pictures are really all about. So over 500 years after Zechariah, what is it that Jesus would announce? He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. So we don't have to be oppressed by the horns. We don't have to be oppressed by anything else. The heavy artillery is coming in. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. So you see how these, even these pictures are actually just fulfilled in Jesus Christ right now. And then he sat back and he rolled back the scroll and he said, this has come, to get, this has come true now, it's me. <laughs> you know, you can imagine them sort of sitting back, ooh. So, you know, although that passage is straight from Isaiah, it can come straight from Zechariah just as much. It's a jolly exciting book. Okay, so chapters 7 and 8, I, don't, I can't remember what I did with these. Chapter 7 is really about loving your neighbour as yourself. So it's really fulfilling Leviticus 19.18. And it, it's comparing... What it's doing is comparing the, f the false showy fasting that was going on. You remember in Isaiah 58, where, where God says, 
the type of fasting you're doing is not the type of fasting I think of. You're just fasting to make a show, but I want you to be honest about this. And that, that's what chapter 7 is mostly about. It really highlights Isaiah 58. And you know, this is, a, this is an issue, and it's an issue in many churches now. You know, the showy practice of religion, the look at me practice of religion, if you like, carries absolutely no weight in the kingdom of God. And remember when Jesus, he walked into the temple and he watched some people putting money into the offering. And then he saw this poor little woman come and she put a little bit of a penny in. And you can imagine all those around her saying, oh, is that all? And Jesus said, well, she's given everything. She's the worshipper. That's what chapter 7 is about. It's actually refocusing our worship. So not just their lives, but their worship. Don't just have showy worship, have honest worship, says God. And chapter 8 is really <laughs> the vision of Gentiles and foreigners longing for and getting hold of the salvation of God in Judah. That's us. You know, and if you look in, in Isaiah 52, the end of Isaiah 52, it actually talks about that. You know, many were astonished at you. Many were astonished. You know, it, it, it's as if people just want, couldn't wait to get in. Couldn't get in. And that's what this is about. And we'll just read that passage of Isaiah 8. And I've cut a couple little bits out. But it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, People yet shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go once to entreat the favour of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts. Where? In Jerusalem. This is Isaiah, it's, it's, sorry, Zechariah 8, 20. They're going to find it in Jerusalem and to entreat the favour of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of the Jews, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. That's what Isaiah is all about. It's saying, you know, God is coming, God is sorting out, and people are saying, right, well, we've got to grab hold of this because this is important. So it not only fulfills Acts chapter 2, but it also fulfills Revelation 22, where, you know, it says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter into the city gates. And this isn't just, you know, this is open to everybody. Blessed are those who wash their robes, blessed are those who repent. That's what he's talking about. Blessed are those who repent. And he says, from all nations, those who have repented, from all nations, so as to enter God's peace. Wow. I like this. So Zechariah chapter 1, part 1, was about chapters 1 to 8, really. And what it's left us with is this, is this tantalizing, tantalizing vision of not only is God coming with his full cavalry, but the solution is in one who is much more powerful and much more attractive than anything else we've ever seen. So, part two, in a sense, chapters 9 to 11. And um, I'm going to look at these. In a way, because th th these are really a royal chapter. God, God is seen, what does that write here? God is seen as the divine warrior fighting the battle, good versus evil, through the Messiah. And that's the, the Messiah which the people will eventually reject. And when we read chapter 9, it says, I, I read a little passage just from 9 from verse 9 to 11. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Listen to the next bit. You'll know this one. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
I will cut off the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bows shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from the sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. And as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. So he's continuing on that wonderful, wonderful scene about being set free. This is back to Isaiah 61. This is all this wonderful stuff that Zechariah is bringing through, but he's taking even more forward, even more forward. Now, I want you to imagine something. 500 years after Zechariah wrote this, you're wandering around Jerusalem, maybe doing your shopping in Sainsbury's, and there you are, and suddenly there's a bit of a hubbub. And people are gathering, and they, they've got all these plants, and you don't know what's happening, but you're going to have a look. And then you see, in amongst all this hubbub, there is somebody royally mounted on a donkey, coming in to Jerusalem. Just as was told 500 years before. Now, they would have known the scriptures. We tend to think people didn't, but the old the folk did. They knew it, they learnt it, they learnt it by heart. They would have known. And any little inkling, and somebody just tweaking them saying, hey, we think this is the king of the you know, King of Kings, this is the Messiah. Wow! Heaven! Wonderful. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it fantastic? This is the best day ever. Let's get some plants. Let's do we'll, we'll, we'll join in this celebration. Now you might think that's a bit extreme. Well, in 1940, Winston Churchill gave a speech. And the speech was, we will fight on the beaches. Not them on the beaches, by the way. Just fight on the beaches. And so on. And that was at the beginning of a very dark time in this country. But Churchill, whether he saw it, I'm sure he did, could see a light. He could see something inside him. He believed something inside him. So he gave this speech. Now, forward five years. Victory in Europe Day. I remember when Churchill said, we will fight them and we will win. I remember that. I remember that. Oh, let's go and celebrate. Let's have another pint. Do you see what I mean? This is what Zechariah is doing. He set it up so that when Jesus came in, people could recognize exactly what was happening and say, wow, this is it. Wow, this is it. And you know, we have this in our own lives. We can see God working. We just need to look. We need to look and we need to listen. We need to watch what God's doing. We need to see what God, doing, God is doing. And you know, it's incredible because when one negative thing happens that really drops you down into the pit you find that God is raising something else up in somebody else's heart and somebody else's spirit and they're raising it up and it's what it's doing is it's winning and I'll give you a little example recently the um, totally personal example and I get very aggravated with this but I'll nevertheless but re recently there was a judgment made about abortion of particularly with children with Down syndrome up to the up to the date of birth basically and this you know was the appeal or the, the case was thrown out by the, by the um, High Court and basic part of the judgment was that the people concerned, the babies concerned, would not have a significant life or would probably not have a significant life. The young lady who brought the case then turned to the judge at the end and said, do you consider my life then not worth living? She has Down syndrome and so is her husband. But what's happened since then is that it has awoken up Christians and non-Christians, but particularly Christians who are Down syndrome, and they're saying we have importance, we have life. We've been downtrodden, we've been told that we're rubbish. But something, someone has sparked in them that there is a victory to be won. This is what Zechariah is about. He's saying there's a victory to be won here. And 500 years afterwards, it happened. So there we are, that's what that is about. Yeah, King arrives. And then chapters 9 and 10 and 11, the Good Shepherd. And really that's what this is about. For the household gods 
utter nonsense. It says in Zechariah 10. Um, right, we'll just leave that. Zechariah 10, 2 and 3. For the household God, says God, utter nonsense. And the diviners see lies. And they tell false dreams and give empty consolation. Therefore the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for lack of a shepherd. My anger is hot against the shepherds. And I will punish the leaders. And then in Zechariah 11, it says this. So I became the shepherd of the flock, doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders. I looked to, you know, I took two staffs, one named Favour and the other named Union, and I tended the sheep. I just think that's such a gentle thing. There were four shepherds leading the sheep astray. They were just going down and effectively just going to die. And then God comes in and he says, no, I am going to be your shepherd. And there were really four main things here that was the shepherds were doing wrong, the, the four shepherds. They were encouraging idol worship. They were relying on diviners and fortune tellers. They tell, were telling false dreams and false prophecy and they give empty consolation. OK. What's happening in the media? All those four things happen regularly in the media. Be careful what we watch. Be careful what we watch. Because they will encourage idol worship. They will rely on diviners and fortune tellers to say, I know. They will tell false dreams. Oh, this could happen. And they give empty consolation. And what does God say he's going to do with those shepherds? He's going to destroy them. He's going to get rid of it. So we don't need to fear, but we do need to be aware. And I think that, to me, is very, very important. And what is God going to do? It says in chapter 10, verses 6 to 7, God, instead of giving false idols and things, he said, I will strengthen the house of Judah. I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have compassion on them. And they shall be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God, and I will answer them. Then Ephraim shall be like a mighty warrior, and their hearts shall be glad with wine, and the children shall see it and be glad, and their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. So this is coming back, this is a proper shepherd. This is where we should be, this is the one who is leading us. I will bring them home, it says in Zechariah 10.10. 10. I will bring them home from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria and I will bring them into the land of Gilead to the Lebanon and there will be no room for them. It will be so much. Oh, what a promise this is. This is just a promise of God taking over and fulfilling everything. So yeah, we don't need to be afraid of what people tell us. We just need to be aware and the final three chapters, 10, uh, sorry, 12, 13, and, and uh, 14, are it's a wonderful picture of the kingdom of God coming on earth with the whole earth cleansed. Whole earth cleansed. Zechariah 12, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on me whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for a firstborn. Now have that in mind as you then read Matthew 27 and Luke 23. When the centurion and those who were with him kept watching over Jesus and the earthquake that took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. That was a centurion. That's one of the ones who's coming in from the outside. He said, truly, this was the son of God. And then he said, Father, into your hands, said Jesus, in Luke 23, I commit my spirit. And having breathed his last, he said, the centurion saw what had taken place. He praised God and he said, certainly this one man was innocent. And the crowds, all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. 
That is totally, that's just Isaiah 12, put in a nutshell. I will pour out of the house of David a spirit of grace, and they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for me. Zechariah 13, on that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitant of Jerusalem to cleanse them from all sin and uncleanliness. And what's that talking about? Acts chapter 2, what's it talking about? It's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit, pouring in. Holy Spirit just doesn't come in little droplets. You get soaked. Absolutely soaked. I always remember my friend Philip, Philip Greenslade, Phil Greenslade, saying that when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he said for a whole week he was totally useless to anybody apart from God. He said, I just couldn't get enough. I just couldn't, I just got soaked in it. And, um, you know, and it said, what did it say? The day of Pentecost arrived. They were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a rushing wind and filled the entire house where they were sitting. <laughs> It just filled it. That's what happens here. God fills it. That's what happens in your house over there. Do you know that? When you're meeting with God, your house is filled with the Holy Spirit. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's good, isn't it? He's here. That's what he wants to do. He just wants to lift us up, fill us with the Holy Spirit. And then on in chapter, we move on to chapter 14. And then on that day there shall be no light or cold or frost and there shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord neither day nor night but in evening time there shall be light there shall be light but that's a different kind of light on that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem so in chapter 13 it's flowing in Jerusalem on chapter 14 it's flowing out from Jerusalem interesting yeah and half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea it shall continue in summer and as in winter and the Lord will be king over all the earth hallelujah and on that day the Lord will be one and his name one and remember in Acts 2, two when they been filled with the Spirit, they went out and Pe Peter preached an amazing sermon, wonderful sermon. And he said, but at the evening time, yeah, sorry, preached this sermon. And then all the people listening said, brothers, what shall we do? This is too much. The chariots of God, if you like, are coming into our lives and we can't stop it. What shall we do? And, P and Paul, Peter said, Repent, be baptised every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness. I love that. Everyone, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So this is going right back to Isaiah. It's a, you know, this isn't, you, you can't measure the kingdom of God anymore. You can't just put it into Judah. You can't just put it into Israel. You can't even put it into the little conclave that was in Egypt when they were there. You can't do that anymore. There's no measuring tape big enough because this is the size of God. And that's what we're in. We're in the kingdom of God. And it's unmeasurable and unfathomable. And it's wonderful. And that's what Zechariah is about. And it's all in the name of Jesus. I don't know about you, but Zechariah is quite a book. And these prophets are quite a book. Don't you think? And I'm going to 